Hello YouTube, I have some questions for any eliminative materialists out there. I don't know if there is much of an eliminativist community on YouTube, but I'll ask the questions and see if we get much of a response. Um, so, eliminative materialism is the thesis that our common sense psychology, or at least substantial parts of our common sense psychology, are radically false. Um, so, you know, an eliminativist might say that pains or beliefs and desires or fears and hopes or sensations or emotions or whatever uh, don't exist, right? Um, and, you know, there's a big debate about that. I, um, However, there's one big problem which I haven't seen discussed, and maybe it has been discussed, maybe I'm just not aware of it, but I've read read quite a bit about this and I haven't, haven't seen this discussed by anybody. So, um, the problem is if it's the case that substantial parts of our common sense psychology are radically false, um, surely we would expect to see radically different psychologies, radically different common sense psychologies, uh, when we look at different societies, or when we look at our own society throughout history. We would expect to see major changes there. Um, I mean, if you take cosmology, for example, uh, you don't find any sort of uniformity in the different cosmologies. There's there's a, a radically different cosmologies when you look at different societies, and that's the case for pretty much every domain of inquiry. So now maybe I'm wrong. Maybe when when you look at other societies, we do find radically false psychologies. But I I don't think that is I don't think that's true. I think that there's, it's basically uniform. No matter what society you look at, you find pains, beliefs, desires, sensations, emotions, hopes, fears, all of those, all of the elements, the, the most fundamental elements that make our folk psychology are found in pretty much all societies. Um, may, maybe I'm wrong there, but uh, I, think, I think that's the case. And that seems to me to pose a pretty serious problem to eliminative materialists, which, as I say, I don't know if that's been discussed, so if anybody if anybody has any response to that problem, I'd be interested to hear it. Another interesting point that I read in a blog a while ago, um, I don't remember where, uh, so don't ask me for the source, but um, it was about the analogies that defenders of eliminativism will draw in trying to make eliminativism seem more plausible. So um, let's take one of the favourites of the Churchlands, the, the old folk cosmology theories based on the idea of crystal spheres, right? So, you know, the analogy is back then in those times you had all these people debating about the nature of the crystal spheres or whatever. But then along comes the this radical new thinker who says, ah, you know, actually this whole debate, all of these these arguments are completely misconceived because there are no crystal spheres. You know, and, and actually the theory of, of crystal spheres, this whole world view based on crystal spheres will be replaced by a, a new scientific astronomy. Um, you know, and that, that does perhaps seem to lend support in, in, at least in making eliminativism seem a bit more intuitively plausible, you know, I mean, could it be the case that we, we have all these debates about beliefs and desires and emotions and such, and the nature of those things, but could it be the case that we are just completely wrong and that they don't exist? Um, but the point that was raised on this blog was that it's it's sort of difficult at this point to know what the correct analogy to draw would be. So, at least at this point, you know, does the eliminativist is is the is the correct analogy that the eliminativist denies the existence of crystal spheres, or is it more like you know would the correct analogy be more like that the eliminativist denies the existence of stars, denies the existence of points of light in the sky? Um, it's it's kind of difficult to know what analogy we would we we should draw until you know after the debate until the debate is over. Um, and, you know, there are other examples. So take phlogiston. Am I pronouncing that right? I don't know. Um, but phlogiston. Uh, <clears throat> so the eliminativist might say, uh, 
these debates about phlogiston are completely wrong, they're wholly misconceived because phlogiston doesn't exist. Or, the Olympist might say, these debates about phlogiston are completely wrong, wholly misconceived because there is no such thing as fire, fire doesn't exist. Or, you know, there is no such thing as these hot, flickery, orangey things, they don't exist. Um, now obviously, if the correct analogy is that uh, our modern eliminativists are like the people who denied the existence of crystal spheres or denied the existence of phlogiston, then, you know, eliminativism is perfectly reasonable. But if, on the other hand, our modern eliminativists are like people who would deny the existence of stars, the existence of points of light in the sky, you know, the existence of fire, of hot, flickery, orangey things, well, then that doesn't so strongly speak in favour of eliminative materialism. I mean, I guess, um, I guess some eliminativists could just bite the bullet. I mean, if you accept an extreme version of the incommensurability thesis, then you could simply say that, you know, what the crystal spheres theorists are talking about when when they talked about stars, that's not actually the same as what we talk about when when we're talking about stars, or what the phlogiston theorists were referring to when when they talked about fire, that's not the same as what we refer to when we talk about fire. Or, or even hot flickery orangey things, when we talk about these hot flickery orangey things, it's not the same as what they were talking about uh, when they discussed the hot flickery orangey things, or whatever. I mean, I guess, I guess you could accept that. Um, that would be pretty extreme kind of incommensurability. I don't know if anybody would accept that, but, um, you know, that's possible. Um, I mean, although, you know, I mean, it answers the objection that if, if eliminative materialism, if the correct analogy is to people who deny the existence of stars and fire, I suppose it answers that problem, but then it doesn't help make eliminative materialism seem any more intuitively plausible, so um, I guess it's kind of a moot point. Um, but anyway, those are some considerations, and uh, yeah, be be interested to hear some some of your responses to that.